Um, <clears throat> oh, those of you that don't know me. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Dan Zatarski. I am one of the owners uh, with my wife and father-in-law at the pharmacy. So we're a compounding only pharmacy. Uh, and I'll get to that towards the end of the presentation as well. What does compounding pharmacy mean? Um, why are we different than the other pharmacies that are out there? So I'll, I'll touch that at the end. Dr. Dan, two questions. Oh, yeah. As far as recommendations for good nutritionists and or naturopaths, hmm. do you have a list you prefer for specific ailments? Um, I do have a list, and I, I can give that out at the end. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Uh, so here's my medical disclaimer. Those of you that have... Uh, heard me present before. Again, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. I can't be your doctor, but I can certainly meet with you one-on-one -on -one and give you recommendations and so forth. Um, so I don't want you to go home tonight and say that Dr. Dan said to stop all of your prednisone and, you know, do this protocol tonight. So that's not what I'm saying. So these are obviously general guidelines and recommendations that we're going to go through, and we can get through some specifics. There's a seat up here. Come, come on on. Um... Yeah, there's a couple here. Yep. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, thank you. Um, oh, there you go. Perfect. Oh, there you go. All right. Perfect. All right. Oh, we got it. <laughs> All right. All right, so with that, um, this is just to tease all of you. So this is very complicated. There's a lot of biophysiology and chemistry in, in this slide. My goal at the, in an hour, hour and a half from now, though, is that this makes complete sense to everyone here. Um, so that's, that's where we're heading. <laughs> um, I'm not going to discuss this yet. So. But that's autoimmune disease in a nutshell on one page. That's the best slide I could find. All right. Um, so autoimmune disease... Um, the more I work here at this pharmacy, the more, come on in, <laughs> uh, the more I see this every, every, every single day. Uh, when I started pharmacy 15 years ago, um, I rarely saw this in traditional pharmacy. I mean, you got patients with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis and those types of things. Um, almost every patient that I see, though, today has got those among, among many others. I see a lot of patients with Hashimoto's here. Um, and it's just, it's saddening because I think we're, I think we all know intuitively that traditional pharmacy, traditional medicine is just, we're losing the battle on autoimmune disease. Um, so the, the incidence, uh, it just, it's increasing every year. Um, anywhere from about 14 to 23 million people in the U.S. population are affected by autoimmune disease. That's a huge, huge number. Um, one third of the risk of developing autoimmune disease is, is genetically related. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to go through some risk factors tonight. Environment, infectious agents, lifestyle, nutritional factors. So that's really how I'm going to approach tonight's talk. We're not going to go through, you know, how to dose your prednisone or when's the best time to give your Humira shot. You know, that's not, that, that's not tonight. That's not the talk I'm giving. Um, so I apologize if that's what you came here for tonight. So we're going to go on a, a functional medicine journey tonight of how do we resolve and get to the root cause of your autoimmune disease and hopefully you know put it to rest we can't eliminate it completely but we can sure put it in remission for a long time that's our goal uh, so here there's just some numbers and i'm sure they're growing day by day i can't remember what year i grabbed these from but uh grave disease we got over 10 million people in the u.s psoriasis seven and a half million uh fibromyalgia some of these things are you know, we may not think of as an autoimmune disease. Uh, some of these disorders, conditions, you know, they, they necessarily don't fit a particular category as nicely as we'd like to in medicine or in pharmacy. Um, so, but you can certainly uh, have attributes of fibromyalgia that mimic autoimmune disease. Uh, lupus is very common. There's a couple categories there. Uh, celiac, we talked about Hashimoto's already. Uh, people with low thyroid function, uh, sometimes that is due to an autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's. Uh, we've got rheumatoid arthritis, uh, MS, and then uh, diabetes type 1. I left the number out there, but I think that's around a uh, quarter of a million. Why is type 2 not on um, there? It's more diet related, yep. You're not actually getting the cells of the pancreas getting attacked directly. So at some level, we're all, you know, uh, anyone included, autoimmune, diagnosed or not, we're all going to be on the spectrum, or we can be. Uh, so what, 
what I've kind of categorized this as is three different levels. So either you've got some symptoms or no symptoms, you know, one or two times per month, you might get a flare here or there. Uh, let's just say it's psoriasis or something to that nature. Uh, if you're at a level two, you've got two to three symptoms on most days. And then if you're at a level three, you've got symptoms every single day. Um, so what I'm trying to do tonight is push you back to that next, that previous level or even get you all the way down uh, to zero symptoms. I mean, that's our, that's our ultimate goal. Some people are going to take months to get down here, down to zero. Some people it might take, you know, four weeks. Uh, but everyone's going to have this journey where I want to try to get you off of this autoimmune spectrum. Uh, so what puts you on the spectrum in the first place is, is chronic inflammation. So we could spend two hours talking about, you know, what creates inflammation in the first place, but um, the more inflammation you have in your system, uh, the more chronic inflammatory signals are being produced. That in turn is leading to increasing your risk of autoimmune disease. Uh, so we really want to get at really the root cause of inflammation in your system, in your body. If we figure what out that is, it's going to be different for everyone, then we can, um, again, start resolving that autoimmune condition, whatever it is that you have. I'm going to skip that for right now. Um, inflammatory conditions al along the spectrum. So there's, there's a lot of indicators, and we could spend a lot of time on this as well, too. But there's a, a many different um, symptoms, if you will, that indicate that you're on the spectrum. And these are some of those things that you might see day to day, week to week. Um, I just listed a handful of, of symptoms here. There's a lot more, but uh, acne, obesity, excessive weight, uh, cardiovascular disease that might not seem intuitive, um, allergies that one probably seems more obvious, um, arthritis or just achy joints, uh, eczema that kind of waxes and wanes throughout throughout time and certainly does IBS. Some of these things are really hard to pinpoint uh, day to day, week to week if you even have, have some of these symptoms. Alright, so the cause. So Really what I'm going to be focusing on tonight is, is what's on this, this next slide here. So we've got uh, leaky gut, environmental factors, and genetics. So that's what we're going to spend the most of tonight talking about are these three main categories. So um, again, this, each one of these three components is going to be different for each individual. So I mean, to some extent, we're going to say that genetics probably plays about 25, 35% of the role of your autoimmune disease but that's not the entire picture. The majority of what's creating this autoimmune disease is really the leaky gut and then those environmental factors. All right. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of physiology here. Um, the innate immune system, I'm not gonna to talk too much about, but this is basically the, the immune system where it's you know, fighting those pathogens that uh, common cold virus that you come across every now and then. Um, it's fast to respond. Uh, there's really no memory of this, right? So we get colds or flus, you know, every single winter season or what have you, any time, any time of year, um, you know, and your body forgets that, you know, and then, you know, with, we can think of with the, the flu shots that are out there, those vaccines, they have to change every year, right? They're trying to pick which virus, which strain is going to be most prominent. Um, so your innate immune system is in charge of that. Um, but it, it doesn't remember year to year or even day to day, you know, what it attacked last night to keep you safe. Um, so that's, that's the, the innate side of the immune system. Um, you know, this usually involves things like redness, swelling, heat, pain. We all can kind of think of that. We get stung by a bee. You know, your immune system does get alarmed, um, you know, and those four things are going to happen. Um, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. We're going to be talking really about, I'm going to skip that the adaptive immune system. This is kind of really the heart of where autoimmune disease starts and where it starts to go haywire. Um, so this is really the second line of defense for our immune system. It is slower to respond. We'll show you that in just a few slides. Um, so there's more material, more signaling pathways that have to happen for the um, adaptive immune system to kick in. Um, this is where anti antibody production takes place. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, Again, um, so going back to the innate immune system, the, the adaptive immune system does have memory. It can remember 
what it saw last night or last week or last year and protect ourselves against that infection or that pathogen. Um, not that this is terribly important to remember, but some of the cell types that are involved with the adaptive immune system are T cells, and there's different types and different categories of those T cells. Uh, there's also B cells involved, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the important thing to remember with B cells are they, they are the ones that produce the antibodies. And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. So there's five main categories of antibodies. Um, and so here's just some pictures that I found off the web. Um, the structure of them isn't critically important, but I just wanted to show that for everyone. Um, the, the three main categories I'm going to talk about tonight is um, IgA, IgE, and IgG. Um, so these are just, the, the letters don't mean anything. They're just uh, letters that were assigned by whomever basically discovered these, I imagine. Um, but IgA antibodies are, are the most common in our, in our human body. Uh, you're going to find these antibodies in mucosal lining uh, of your gut, respiratory tract, um, the urogenital tract as well. Uh, so these antibodies are going to be coming across bacteria, viruses, whatever that agent, that pathogen may be, and is going to be there to protect our body. Um, IgE uh, is mostly involved with allergies. I'm going to show you some slides on that and how we can use IgE. E antibodies to identify different allergens that we might have. And then IgG, this one's, uh, these antibodies are slow to mobilize, so if you come across like gluten or dairy I have as an example, when you have an IgG related, related action, it might take two, three days for that response to happen. So when I talk with patients on food allergies, are you allergic to dairy, are you allergic to gluten, you know, or, or this food or that food, a lot of times they don't know. Um, a lot of these food allergies um, can be related to IgG as their response, and you just may not have an understanding because it happened two or three days ago. Um, I don't know what I had for dinner last night, so I don't, <laughs> it's going to be hard for to remember um, some of these food allergies and how to specifically um, identify if they're, they're a problematic issue for my body. Question. Yes. Do you like a food allergy test? I do. Yep. Um, I'll get to that in probably two slides. <laughs> um, so, so how does autoimmunity work? So um, this happens again on the adaptive immune side of our immune system. And basically what happens is there's, there's cross-reactive antibodies or T cells that are really the chief culprit in autoimmune disease. So there's, um, you get antibodies that are, let's just say, going after a pathogen, uh, could be a virus. and these antibodies are set up and they're looking after this pathogen, but, and again, we'll, we'll get to this in a moment as well too, is all of a sudden they get misinformation. It's kind of like the analogy I like to use when I talk about cross-reactivity and how autoimmune disease really begins. It's like the antivirus in your computer. Um, so you, we always kind of, you know, this probably happens automatically nowadays where you get your new definitions, if you will. What is your computer going to allow into itself? You know, all of that, those definitions or all that information is uploaded into your computer. Your computer is now supposed to protect itself from, you know, all the viruses that are out there and all the malware. What happens in our immune system is that we get bad information. That, that antibody, yeah, it's attacking some pathogen or some virus. Well, now it's attacking your joint tissue. You know, now you have rheumatoid arthritis. Now it's attacking your skin tissue. Now you've got psoriasis. You know, pick any organ pick any autoimmune disease, you've got some cross-reactivity there and you've got bad information that you've got to get rid of. Um, and so that's where we're going to start looking at some of these antibodies and how do we reprogram them? How do we upload, Hi. Hi there. Sorry. How do we upload new definitions into our, into our software? So here's... I, this picture might be a little bit hard to see, but um, we've got Hashimoto's, so we've got two autoimmune diseases. We have Hashimoto's and Graves, both dealing with thyroid function. Um, so we've got uh, T cells here. I'm not going to go through every single player here, but ultimately what's happening is these B cells are activating plasma cells of the immune system to produce an antibody um, that initially probably was designed to go after an infection of some sort, let's say, um, or maybe it was designed to go after gluten. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, instead of these antibodies going and attacking that virus or that, or that food particle that we're allergic to, it, the, the tissue or the cell of the thyroid gland 
looks very similar to that culprit. And so now you've got uh, thyroid cell death. And then when that happens, you don't produce enough T3 and T4. So the end result is low thyroid function. So your body has got misinformation. It's got antibodies that, again, are attacking cells that it shouldn't be attacking. Uh, kind of on the reverse side, you still have antibody production for Graves' disease, uh, but instead of those cells being attacked, now they're stimulated. So with Graves, you've got an overproduction. So um, you've kind of got the opposite. Instead of cell destruction, you've got uh, cell excitement, if you will. Same, same, uh, same idea, the antibody just has misinformation. Um, so that's basically the physiology in a nutshell. I probably boiled down three days of <laughs> information into 10 minutes there. Um, what I want to take us on is a journey of how do, we, how do we reverse this? Again, I'm trying to boil down, you know, over 100 autoimmune diseases and give everyone, this, you know, a, a roadmap tonight when you leave of what are you going to do after tonight to start quelling and, and calming down your immune system. Because you want to calm down the, the autoimmune side, but you don't want to leave, render your, your body useless to fight infections either. So, so we're going to go through leaky gut repair. Uh, we're certainly going to clean up the diet, and I'll look at that quite a bit tonight. Um, we're, going to, we're going to spend a little bit of time on, on removing pollution out of the body, and there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, and then we're going to spend a, uh, just a small amount of time on healing infections and uh, reducing stress. All right, so leaky gut repair. So I think this is one of your questions on your, on your test. You guys didn't think you were going to get homework today. but um, What is the percent of the immune system that re resides in the GI tract? Does anyone know what that number is? 80. 80%, yes. <laughs> That's exactly it. Um, so we're going to spend a lot of time here in the GI tract for probably the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so if you have an autoimmune disease, your gut is struggle, struggling under under a poor diet, plain and simple. I don't care how healthy your diet is right now. If you're here tonight, you're probably struggling and that's why you want to get more information. So um, I will almost guarantee that we can all, even myself included, um, improve on our diet to basically stack the cards in our favor to calm down our, our autoimmune disease. Um, so I'll get to this 30-day diet challenge in a little while as well. So what is really meant by leaky gut? Leaky gut is meant by this right here. So on, the, on your three feet of your small intestine, you've got just a, a labyrinth of little fingerlings, if you will, microvilli. And you've got one layer of cells called enterocytes that basically separate what's in your food and in your bloodstream. And so when you have leaky gut, you basically have a breakdown of that one layer of cells. Yeah. And so uh, what ensues is you get you, everything. You get minerals and vitamins that don't absorb uh, with leaky gut uh, for numerous reasons. But then you have food particles that are coming in like gluten or dairy or casein. could be anything for many different patients uh, that should not be entering. Uh, you've got infections that can be getting through. You've got medications that are um, maybe not being absorbed as well. Um, and then stress kind of covers this whole layer, which adds a whole other complexity to everything. Um, can really make the, all the problems just that much worse. All right. So some of the symptoms, you know, you know, how do you know if you have leaky gut? What does that mean? Um, these are just a handful of, of symptoms to let yourself know, you know, do I have to worry about this? Um, so with osteoporosis or osteopenia, if you have poor bone mineral density, that would be an indicator. Um, as far as the, the CNS or the, the brain is involved, anything, anyone with anxiety, depression, brain fog, uh, you could relate that, those symptoms to leaky gut. Uh, bloating, constipation, diarrhea for di digestion. Um, we do a lot of hormones here. For those of you that know uh, the pharmacy well enough, we do a lot of bioidentical hormones here. Um, if you have irregular periods, PMS, menopausal symptoms, that could be a sign of leaky gut syndrome. Um, with the immune system, if you've got frequent infections, joint pain, muscle pain, um, SIBO, which is small intestinal um, overgrowth of bacteria, uh, if you've got uh, candida infection in your GI tract, 
Um, and then with skin-related issues, acne, eczema, rosacea, these are all indicators that you might have, have leaky gut. Um, so what can cause leaky gut in the first place? There, there's, we um, spend a lot more time on this. I just gave you, a, you know, the, the, the top on my list of, of causes. Uh, foods tend to be the biggest culprit. Um, so alcohol, dairy, eggs, uh, gluten's a big one. Uh, grains, legumes, nightshade vegetables, I'll get to that in a minute, what that means. Uh, just sugar in general. Uh, chemotherapy, uh, gut infections, so parasites, again, SIBO, uh, yeast infections, and then certain medications, um, antacids, I've got a whole talk on antacids and, and their improper use. Um, antibiotics can pull coals and break down those, that, those enterocytes, um, birth control pills. Um, one that I see quite often are the overuse of NSAIDs or non so your, your medications like your Aleves, your naproxens, diclofenac, um, prednisone, which is a common agent for treating autoimmune disease, creates, can create more of a leaky gut syndrome. Uh, myotoxins, so I know for those of you that came to the Dr. Whitcomb seminar, um, spoke on two hours of all the negative effects of mold and, and uh, mold components, um, you know, these myotoxins that can create uh, disruption in the GI tract. Uh, radiation, I think that's an obvious one that just literally will just uh, rip shreds of our GI tract. Uh, it's just physical stress, um, um, emotional stress, um, that can create such an issue and then surgeries as well. Treatment, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it's not radiation on your gut? It, and anywhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is GERD considered autoimmune? No, not that I've, I've heard. Yeah. Um, so the first thing we want to do um, is, we, we, you know, any autoimmune disease, I want to make sure that the gut is completely sealed up, uh, that we don't, we don't have any issue of, of permeability whatsoever. Um, so we all kind of know this, I think, already by now, but the GI tract uh, represents the largest interface with the external environment. We've got, you know, I think the estimate is with all those microvilli and the enterocytes in the small intestine, we've got the surface area of like a, was a double tennis court, something like that, is some of the, the numbers I've heard. So you've got a large surface area that your body has to, to look over to make sure that it's letting in the good things but keeping out the bad. Um, <clears throat> we know that chronic uh, GI dysfunction will have systemic health consequences. Um, it's impossible to have a proper functioning immune system when the gut is burdened by, uh, with dysfunction or imbalance. And GI dysfunction limits the efficacy of most um, or all oral therapies. So we really want to make sure that there's a very distinct uh, barrier between, again, what's, in your, what's inside your GI tract and what's in your bloodstream on the other side. <clears throat> that. All right. So we're going to spend a little time on how do we how do we seal up this this huge opportunity for again gluten, dairy, any kind of food allergen coming through. Um, how do we make sure that the nutrients are coming in, um, but the bacteria and the viruses and parasites are staying out. Um, <clears throat> So the first thing we're going to do um, is we're, we're going to remove the culprit, and I'll get to that too in just a minute because uh, the culprit is going to be different for every single person here, or it can be, um, and we'll get to that in a moment as well too. But we have to identify what is creating the, the, the breakdown of the, of the GI tract. Once we figured that out, then we want to restore proper digestion. So things like enzymes, um, sometimes my favorite is um, stomach acid or betaine, hydrochloride, and pepsin will improve uh, and restore digestion properly. Um, and then we're going to re-inoculate, so we're going to talk about probiotics and why everyone should be on a probiotic when they leave the door tonight. And then we're going to go through the repair process. Um, so things like L-glutamine, um, another product called IgG Protect. Um, or you could replace this with uh, colostrum or bovine colostrum, 
would be another word for, uh, or another product that encompasses IgG, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, but those are the four key things that you want to get down in repairing the GI tract. If we can, if we can accomplish this, this, and this is the hardest thing to do, in, in, in all honesty, in my opinion, um, if you can accomplish this, you're going to be moving yourself even completely off of that, that autoimmune spectrum. That's really what, what, again, what our goal should be. Okay, so finding your culprit. Um, so food allergy <laughs> testing we now have available here. Um, honestly, you can get food allergy testing from your doctor. You know, there's a, a lot of places offer food allergy testing. Um, we use a, a lab out in Waukesha um, that does food allergy testing for us now. Um, but you want to find out what that culprit is. Maybe if you've never had a food allergy test done, I highly recommend getting it done just as a, an assurance on your end that you're not eating something every single day that's you know, breaking down your GI tract. Uh, the number one culprit, culprit is gluten, and we'll talk about that. What's the difference between food allergy and food sensitivity? Food allergy. So you could, right, so, you, so the food allergy, is, you have an antibody to that food. So you can be sensitive to something and, and, not, and not tolerate it, but it's not immune related. You don't have an antibody to it that causes a, a larger reaction in your, in your system. That's, yeah, that's, I'll, maybe the next slide will help clarify that. Yeah. Is that food test, that allergy testing, is that a blood draw? It is a blood draw, yeah. So that the food allergy testing is measuring um, IgE antibodies. Um, the other things you want to do is, um, and we talked about this already, but you're avoiding things like alcohol, caffeine, uh, grains, legumes, uh, dairy, nightshade vegetables, eggs, whatever that culprit is. These are just some of the more common ones. Um, you got to identify what that is and, and get rid of it. Um, so I, I did the food allergy testing um, with the lab out in Waukesha. Um, this is my first time doing a food allergy test, but luckily I had zero across the board. Um, this is just a control down here. Um, but they give you a, a quantitative number of, of what that amount of IgE that they're actually measuring in that food allergy test. So do you go there or does it, are you doing You just do the blood draw. Yeah, we're just sending them the, the blood the vial blood. And we can do that with all the doctors? Yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. What's the cost of it? Uh, cost is 360, 360. That's for 30 uh, food allergens. 30? Mm -hmm. How does that, that compare to the Alcan test? Al Alcat? Yeah, you've heard that on Dr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, that one's fine as well, too. I don't know what the cost of that one Al is, but... You know, there's another slide that I have that, I mean, yeah, there's like LCAT and Cyrex tests that are out there that you can have, you know, one to 200 different food allergens test, right? And I'll show you in a minute here where you can kind of make some comparisons. We're, Cope Labs did this intentionally to focus on the top 30 allergens that, that they saw that were out there. And then from there, you can, you can infer some other cross sensitivities that you may have. Dan, when, when do you start getting into the numbers where it's problematic? Are, are ones the issue or are the fives the issue? I mean, that's going to be different for everyone, honestly, but obviously the greater the number, the greater, I mean, you've got a stronger response to it for sure. Yeah. How does that compare to skin tests like the PCR? Mm -hmm. it, it's, I like this system better compared to skin testing because it, it's more quantitative for me. It gives me an actual number. I'm going to skip this slide. This is an um, inhalation test that I did as well, too. Um, all right, so that was finding the culprit, mainly food allergens that are out there. Second step is going to be uh, restoring digestion. Um, so once the bad is out, once we've identified what is creating that leaky gut syndrome for us, you know, based on just food in general, then I want to start bringing in all the good stuff. So uh, probiotics, enzymes, uh, betaine HCL, which is basically just a powdered form of, of stomach acid. Um, that's really what is going to um, 
start my digestive process working in, in the right direction. Um, so again, for everyone, it's gonna, there's going to be an individual basis here. I'm not saying that everyone's got to take, you know, uh, well, I am saying everyone should take a probiotic. I'll get to that in, in the next slide here. Uh, but enzymes and betaine HCL, um, by no means does every single person with an autoimmune disease have to take those products, but they, they, they can be helpful um, in many instances. Um, so with probiotics, um, there's a, a lot of things going on with probiotics. You get um, which again are just good bacteria for the GI tract. Uh, they stimulate the immune system in a, in a positive uh, effect. Uh, they increase the um, increase of lactose tolerance and digestion. Not that I recommend going out and eating a bunch of dairy or drinking a bunch of milk, um, but it does help with that. Um, it has positive influences on intestinal microflora. So when you take probiotics, um, these, these good bacteria are basic, basically very transient. They're not, um, when you take a probiotic, it, that, that healthy bacteria that you're ingesting basically leads the way for your natural flora, basically the bacteria that you were, the day that you were born, that bacteria has now a chance to flourish and, and repopulate the GI tract. So these probiotics are just there to kind of clear the way and, and let the, the natural bacteria that you've had your entire life uh, you know, grow back up and flourish and, and take over again. Um, they reduce intestinal pH, which is important for digestion of certain uh, foods. Um, helps with lowering cholesterol, helps reduce uh, toxins in the body. Um, probiotics help uh, with the production of B vitamins, folic acid. Uh, you can actually add vitamin K to that as well. Um, restoration of normal intestinal microflora after antibiotic therapy. So anyone that comes in that says they've been on an antibiotic, for surely you want to go on a probiotic. The timing has to be right. When you take an antibiotic, depending on how often it's dosed per day, you know, you're going to have a certain time frame where you want to take that probiotic. You don't want to take the probiotic at the same time you've taken your antibiotic. It's just going to cancel out the, the, the benefits of the probiotic in most cases. Uh, and then probiotics, uh, treatment and prevention of acute diarrhea um, by rotaviruses. So uh, I think we've all probably have heard of that. Uh, this is just, yep. Um, if you've already gone gluten free and you're already taking probiotics, mm -hmm. how is that going to skew the blood results of how bad your issue is if you've already taken some anti, but not a lot of the other stuff that we have? So you, you, I, that allergen test, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tell you how many antibodies. So if you've eliminated gluten long enough, that number should be going down now. Is it going to go down to zero? You're going to have, you're still dealing with the innate immune system, so you're still going to have that memory factor. You're still going to have some residual. You're going to have, you know, there's not going to be a lot of antibody production because those antibodies are being produced when that culprit is seen. But to what level? I mean, that's going to, there's going to be patient variance there, of course. I, I don't have an exact, you know, answer for you other than it's, it, it's going to different, you know, it's going to vary patient to patient. It's, ju it's just part of the process of keeping that culprit out. So even if like you have a gluten exposure, the, taking that probiotic will hopefully lessen that chance of that gluten getting into your, into your systemic system. But just knowing that that is in your system, so you, your number might be lower than it would be if, I, if you're not taking it. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have the alarm by a low number. Correct. Well, Right. It just so you're just you're just you're kind you're kind of at just that status quo. You're kind of just you're kind of in a stalemate at that point. Um, just the probiotic is just going to con continue to increase the um, the efficacy or the the functionality of your GI tract from allowing other material to come in and wreak havoc. But in terms of translating the blood tests, oh, to, to get you to, to the first step in identifying the issues, it could undermine the seriousness. Yeah, so you'd right. So so you'd want to do the blood right. So you want to do the blood test first. Right, but, but, but if that's not what you've done, I think is what she's asking. Right, if you've already, oh, oh, if you've already doing started doing some it. things, is that enough to 
keep the results he needs uh, up, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's um <clears throat> It, it, it's not going to be enough to to do that. You you're still going to you're still going to want to take. I don't know if I'm. I mean, I don't understand the question. But you're still going to want to take that probiotic, reg, regardless of what that that number is. So. so what? Again, this is all hypothetical. If you don't have a baseline, like, you're not going to know what the yeah. difference well, is. Yeah. But to see where you're at now, if you're on a probiotic and see what's still affecting you, would be very well, Plus, it's not like you can take too many probiotics. You can't, no. You know, no. I had an Allen pass that showed nothing. I had no allergies, nothing. So I have no food issues, supposedly, including gluten, dairy, everything. I'm fine. There's n The doctor said I never saw anything like this. But again, probiotic removed all of those things. So I don't know if I have food issues or not. But I do know I had repeated series of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I have a large... Um, Overreaction to histamine. Can those kinds of things cause that as well? To cause the 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 autoimmune. The autoimmune. Ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, then your culprit isn't food. It might be some of the other things we're, we're going to get to. So yeah, yeah. I have that same problem. It's a histamine, histamine intolerance. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. it's not a food allergy. Okay. No. No. Yeah. It's a gut enzyme that's missing. I believe. It can. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. Uh, when you take probiotics, can you take the same probiotic every day? Uh, you can. I, I mean, there's there's different opinions on. I mean, the question was, you know, do you have to take the same probiotic, or can you take the same probiotic every day? The the general answer is to vary your probiotics. I mean, if it's, you know, month to month, or even you know, season to season, that type of thing. Um, there's going to be certain probiotics or certain companies that are going to specialize in certain strains of, of bacteria that they think are going to be the most beneficial. I mean, that we, you know, we're on the tip of the iceberg of what we know on probiotics, honestly, but I think that generally it's not a bad idea to rotate different brands and different, you know, then you're getting different strains of, of good bacteria because they're all going to have different health benefits or health properties to them. So. What, when do you use a prebiotic? Um, Prebiotics, I, I'm not a huge fan of prebiotics, honestly. I, um, you know, things like um, you know, FOS or fructo oligosaccharides, basically sugars and things like that, that, that the bacteria feed on. Um, I think they, they work for some patients, but I don't think it's critical that everyone, every single person take them. I'm not, me personally, I'm not a huge proponent. I don't think they're absolutely critical. Um, some people benefit from them, but... I don't think it's a huge game changer for most people. Um, I'm going to skip that. Um, so this this is just one probiotic again of many. This is the one that I just uh, particularly like. We talked about dosage or, or how much probiotic um, do you need to take. Um, generally speaking, for for autoimmune patients, I recommend at least a hundred billion. Um, at least to start uh, to kind of get, again, the inflammation down, get the GI tract uh, working in, in the right direction. Um, so everyone kind of asked me, yeah, what, how much do I have to take? How often do I have to take a probiotic? Um, you know, th that, that number is going to vary for, you know, from patient to patient. But um, when you kind of get out of the woods and, you, you know, when you're going back to that autoimmune spectrum, uh, when you're you're getting down to that, you know, you have a symptom or two maybe per month, you can lower that number down to, you know, 20 billion. Um, and does that, be, like, this 100 on there is 100 for 100 billion? Mm -hmm. And yep. is that daily? That would be daily, yeah. And after you eat? There's, e either way, you could take a probiotic. With a lot of the probiotics that are out there now are um, acid liable or they're able to tolerate the acidity of your stomach. You could, yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Are all good probiotics that need to be refrigerated? Uh, they, some do. I would honestly follow the manufacturer's recommendation on, on to refrigerate or not. Because if you, if you end up refrigerating a probiotic that doesn't require refrigeration, you'll actually destroy it quicker. Or 
there's yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, and then again, yeah, that's going to be individually based, of course. I mean, some people are going to be more sensitive to taking a high dose of a probiotic and they're going to get like a Herxmeyer reaction. They're just going to get a lot of die off or candida or whatever the case may be. Um, so if you know you're prone to that, yep, start off slow. Yep, and work your way up. Yeah. And there's different probiotics that are out there that are, yeah, 10 billion, 25 billion, and you can ease your way into it too. Yeah, and not, you don't have to go start this all tomorrow night and, and, and jump right into it because they even make a you know there's even companies out there that make it um, one company makes a 225 billion uh, it's not even a capsule because there's so much material there but you have to mix it in with with a liquid to get it all down so um, so again probiotics there you know enhancing uh, mucosal activity uh, so the lining of the GI tract is is there's more integrity there uh, protects the GI barrier from, from further damage um, and helps them modulate these tight, tight junction formations. So the, those cells that we looked at, that permeability slide, it helps the, um, the enterocytes to tighten up and get, you know, fit closer together essentially. Uh, and then the last step here is, is repair. So um, I either have Glutashield or, or Glutamed. Um, there's advantages to each of these products. Um, so what the repair process is doing, um, you know, we're rebuilding, repairing the gut lining, uh, maintaining intestinal structure and function. Uh, these products promote uh, the secretion of IgA, which essentially um, helps to, um, it's immune modulator, it helps to improve the immune system in general, um, helps with microbiota biota signaling or mic microbacteria signaling. Um, it helps to stimulate gut mucosal um, cell proliferation, increases intestinal velus height. So when you looked at those little fingerlings on the permeability slide, it actually helps to increase that surface area, which is a, which is a good thing. Uh, prevents intestinal hyperpermeability, um, and it keeps the, the, the good bacteria from translocating or, or seeping through or, or basically moving away from that, that critical juncture. Mm-hmm. I take it two pills um, twice a day mm -hmm. in the morning and at night, yep. and I take my probiotic at night. How much time am I supposed to be between <coughs> and probiotic? With with nystatin? Am I okay? You're fine. I don't have yeah, I don't I don't see any issue with that at all. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um and then so you've got basically uh, people have asked me, like, what does the GLUT stand for? It's not talking about gluten in these products. It's glutamine, which is an amino acid that helps with the repair process. So that's what that's referring to. Um, and then the other part of the repair process is uh, with something called IgG. So we talked about, you know, a certain subclass of antibodies. Um, the IgGs or the, the the colostrum that I like to use comes from uh, Numedica. It's a product called ImmunoPRP. So basically, it's got a high dose of um, IgGs from bovine colostrum, or basically cow's milk. Um, and then the PRPs are something called proline-rich polypeptides. Um, so this has effects on the, positive effects on the immune system. Um, the product contains lactoferrin, which uh, protects against dysbiosis, or basically just bad bacteria in the GI tract. Um, the PRPs that I talked about enhances uh, immune cell function. Uh, this product also has growth factors that stimulates uh, lining of the GI tract. Um, and then these, these IgGs that are, that are in this product um, protects against bacteria, viruses, um, pathogenic proteins. Uh, so if you're you know, looking at products like gluten uh, getting through the GI tract, this helps to kind of seal the fortress up even more so. Um, in part systemic uh, immunity. So what this means is by taking a high dose of these antibodies that are, that are beneficial, um, you can take that product and, and transfer that, that immunity to yourself. It basically strengthens your immune system uh, just by taking these, these IgGs, which is pretty impressive. Two quick ones. So mm -hmm. from one individual person to another? So just taking the... one individual oh, um, from the product to the person, sorry, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, and, and this yeah. is similar to the, to the 
include them in those things. So if you've got issues with theory and you're taking you have from, no issue, you can. I've actually you can actually the they make a spray out of this as well. You could spray this in your mouth and drink a glass of milk and not have a reaction. It basically is the way I des describe all that. It's kind of a leap of faith, right? But it's it's you're, you're telling your it's again like using the computer analogy. It's telling your your software in your system, your immune system, it's it's casein or it's whatever it is that you're allergic to in the milk. Is it the lactose sugar or the casein protein? It's 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 not a virus. It's not a it's not a pathogen. Okay. We need to calm down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It just looks the other way. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Is it human or bovine? Is bovine. It bovine. Has it been powderized or is it liquid? Form? Powdered. Yeah, there is a liquid, but um, I like the powder just to get a, enough dose in. Um, the scoop is about that of about two tablespoons. Uh, so to use it in liquid form, you'd have to drink quite a bit. Yeah. Um, you could do this irregardless of the probiotic. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Dan, so yep. like raw milk, a lot of people that are sensitive don't have that with raw milk, probably there. All, all the proteins aren't fragmented and that type of thing. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And there, this product is actually casein free, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's the same as mother's milk. Okay. The first liquid that comes into the breast is colostrum. Colostrum. Is there a better time of the day to take that? Timing of day? I, I haven't heard, no. <coughs> Morning, night, yeah. Okay. yeah. I have it, I just don't know when to, to take it. Yeah. <coughs> um, all right, so that was, that was all phase one. So now we're um, jumping to phase two. Um, so cleaning up, cleaning up the diet. Um, Again, the gluten, grains, legumes, um, gluten can be found in many grains. So we got wheat, rye, barley. Again, there's a lot of cross-reactivity with gluten, so we've got to be careful with that. Um, you know, even oats, oats technically doesn't have the gluten or the, um, the gluten protein, but a lot of times with just um, cross-contamination, that can be an issue. Um, Rice, millet, again, cross-reactivity could be with corn or quinoa. And I'll show you a slide. It's a little bit hard to read, but um, when you get into the food allergy testing, it'll, it'll show you some of these cross-reactivity uh, products that you might have issues with. Um, legumes, so lentils, chickpeas, peas, green beans, any other type of, of bean, uh, red, white, black kidney beans. Um, you generally, generally want to stay away from all of these materials. Um, in essence, what these are going to do is just going to create more of a leaky gut syndrome for the GI tract. Um, so we want to remove these for at least, this is where the 30-day challenge comes in. Um, basically take what's on this slide and whatever you have on a food allergy test and eliminate all of that material for at least 30 days. So there's, there's, and it, and there's, right. So there's, there's certain proteins that are basically creating a, um, a permeability issue for the GI tract. Yeah. Um, nightshade vegetables. Um, some people have issues with these. Again, I would just remove these as well, just as well. But um, uh, so eggplant, peppers. Um, the black pepper spice is okay. You don't have to get rid of that. Uh, potatoes, remove those. Uh, again, sweet potatoes are okay. And then t uh, tomatoes. Um, so those should be removed as well. Okay. Nope. So if you didn't test positive, is it okay to keep those in your diet then? Well, that's, that's kind of the million dollar question. I would argue to remove them just for the 30 days. I want to I see how you're going to react after a month of removing all of this material because just because I don't have an IgG, IgE reaction on that food allergy test 
how do we know that that protein or that gluten still, even though there's not an antibody reaction in, in your own system to that material, how do we know that it's still not tearing down or weakening your, your, your GI tract? We don't, unless we go in and basically do a biopsy. So if we just remove all of this, these possible suspects, after 30 days, you're either, you're either gonna feel a lot better or you're not. Tough challenge, I know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is there a list of food to carry? There is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't include that, but yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Not very uplifting talk, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it is, it's, it, it gets very limiting. And, and, and part of that is, is if you have those issues with those, with the, those many foods, I want, I don't want to keep building up the wall and repairing the wall with those products, with those supplements. And at the same time on the back end, you are taking in, in some type of food product that is then tearing it down. And it's, we're the only really truly going to know that if we anything and and everything that we've known we've been allergic to or have a sensitivity to i want to get rid of it so which is to fiber you've taken all the fiber away, fiber away. yes really yeah. there's so what do you do i'm a proponent of yeah, fiber it's good for you yeah i know there's it it's there's there's a whole there is a list and you know, I didn't include it but there is a list I mean, whatever those foods are that um, are still okay for you to eat you know by all means you can, you know we need to be very selective on those type of things yeah but we're, well, yeah when we're getting into fixing autoimmune disease we yeah this isn't like a diet that everyone needs to adopt and it's not you know it's yeah there's some certain long-term things that we're going to stay away from absolutely um, gluten being one of them you know, because that, that, whether you test positive for gluten or not, it's, it's still going to cause an inflammatory reaction in your, in your system, in your GI tract. And so we want to, why stack the cards against us and keep introducing gluten when it's, it's continually going to have an inflammatory response in, in anybody, re regardless of if, if we have an allergy to it or not. So yes. you do the, you're off of these things for 30 days and then a one food at a time reintroduction? Yeah, I mean that, and that's yeah, and that would be where you get, you know, it's probably for another talk, but yeah, or very individually based. You know, what can we then reintroduce? It would be a, 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 a slow process of of bringing in certain certain foods back in. So, another unanswerable question, but like, kind of, what have you seen the time process be like for somebody to be feeling better? Usually, the I usually go by that 30-day mark. That because it the nice thing about the GI tract, and if you're removing these these food allergens or whatever, you know, maybe that's just, maybe that's just the wrong word, but uh, in, you know, sensitivity to a food product. Um, the nice thing is the GI tract, the cells in the GI tract do turn over quite rapidly. Um, so within that, I would say that four to four to eight week range, you're gonna you're gonna have a basically a whole new lining of your GI tract that's going to be turned over for the most part. So um, we, want to, we want to repair that fortress, build it back up, and not keep tearing it down. Do you recommend having um, the nuts that you have sprouted? I would just rather stay away from them completely. Well, nuts, nuts yeah. yeah. There's other proteins that are still in there um, that, again, can be problematic. <laughs> Yeah. 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 We'll get. Yeah. It is fun. No nuts at all. No nuts at all. Yeah. So where's the 
Well, there, <laughs> well, there's yeah, well, it will, meats. Uh, well, we'll get to that too. Healthy fats, but yeah. Um, I thought I had. Oh, GMO. I would I would stay away from those. Uh, so, um, so in the going back to the food sensitivities or the food allergies. Um, so when you when you get this re report from um, Cope Labs, they basically um, give you a uh, uh, cross reactivity chart as well too. Um, I didn't print this out, but um, you know for my test example, you know for wheat flour, I didn't have any uh, cross reactivity, but you know, if you have an issue with wheat flour, you know, there's other issues there. Even with, um, you could potentially have with gluten uh, a cross re reactivity to eggs. So you want to be careful there. So there's a whole list, um, you know, if you're becoming allergic to a certain material, there's maybe not, you're not creating a reaction to that other material, but there are other foods that you would want to stay away from. So they give you that as well too, which, which is nice. Um, yeah, here's a here's a slide of it, but it's impossible to read. Um, all right. Um, phase three: identifying toxins. Um, so, how toxins trigger autoimmune disease? There's a, a lot of different ways here, but some of the toxins that we that again, some of the, a lot of these we we probably intuitively know, but heavy metals, uh, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, and you know, there's thousands of industrial chemicals out there, PCBs, dioxins. Uh, we talked about uh, mycotoxins from mold already. Um, <clears throat> uh, just on the, the theory or the mechanism behind heavy metals, um, which are known immune disruptors, um, there's kind of two theories out there on heavy metals. Either they're, um, they're damaging the cell, so the immune system fails to recognize uh, new material, um, or the heavy metal is ultra stimulating uh, the immune system to just be overreactive. But either way, the heavy metals, the mercury, the lead, cadmium, and so forth, um, the end result is it's creating inflammation in our, in our body um, and it's causing the immune system to act you know, inappropriately. So um, again, there's a multitude of different ways to go about this. I'm not gonna go into this into great detail, um, but we should be doing heavy metal testing if we think that's a culprit. Um, and then, again, work with a provider that's knowledgeable on, on getting that material out of our system. Do you do heavy metal testing? I don't. I don't. Um, um, so my approach is, you know, prevention is your, is your best bet when it comes to toxic material and disrupting the immune system. Um, so I just listed a, a few brief <coughs> things here, but, um, you know, keep your air clean. I mean, these, again, are all intuitive, but um, so installing HEPA filters in your house. I mean, we can uh, probably make a very strong argument that the air actually in our house is more toxic than outside sometimes with all of the outgassing of, of the plastics in our house and so on and so forth. Um, Stain-resistant carpeting, the list goes on. Um, make sure you're drinking as clean of water as possible, so I recommend getting an RO system um, either at the tap or in your whole house. Um, buying clean organic food um, and then um, you know we have a whole talk on keeping toxins off of your body so personal care products um, being aware of what we're putting on our body is, is that creating an immune uh, reaction or not I, I honestly don't know if that's the case or not. I don't, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. We're ready to get the plate. Get the plate. Yeah. Um, 
So again, cleaning up your environment as, as best you can. Um, and then, you know, detoxing your body. Um, I like the Core Restore Kit for this. Um, this is a whole one week program to remove uh, toxins out of your body using, uh, you know, basically enhancing your, your body's natural phase one, phase two detox processes. Um, this is a one week program or a kit that you take to help clear out toxins out of your, out of your system. Um, um, I like to find out too, I just started doing this, um, but for, again, genetics is playing a part of our, our autoimmune disorder disease. Um, it's in, not that this is a huge game changer, um, but if you're struggling, you know, you've cleaned up your diet, you, you've done a lot of other changes, um, you know, in your environment, um, again, to keep your immune system running smoothly and you're still not where you need to be, um, sometimes, you know, let's go and do the genetic test and see what those genetic predispositions are. Maybe you're not a good methylator. Um, you know, they've come a long, long way at identifying um, things called SNPs or single nucleotide uh, polymorphisms, which basically means that you have a, de uh, a genetic predisposition that allows you to not clear heavy metals or not metabolize your estrogens properly, and those are accumulating. There's a multitude of different things that we could spend all night even talking about that, but if we're struggling, we're not figuring out what that, what's keeping our immune system from, from basically identifying self versus non-self. It might be um, nice to get a genetic test and figure out, you know, if there's something there. Is that similar to the MFPHI? Yeah, that's what you would, yeah. Like the, the company that I like, um, that I used was 23andMe, but yeah, you'll, you get all the raw data and you can take that information and, um, there's different companies that you can then take that, your material, your information, and find out what all those different SNPs are and genetic predispositions are. And then how often do you do infrared sauna? Once a week, twice a week? Twice a week. Uh, you, you don't want to detox too much too quick. Um, I mean, you, I would start out slower with the infrared sauna, maybe you know, two to three times a week. But as you build a tolerance to, to using the sauna, you could use it every day. Oh, yeah. I agree. This yeah. is part of my passion. Yeah. Like, you know, good tests are being downplayed because yeah. of misunderstanding. So, yeah. 23 me is still a really good test. Yeah. yeah. And just, and just get, yeah. yeah. Lots of information yeah. about heritage and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. No, no, that's a, quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, uh, glutathione. Um, I really think of glutathione as basically your. I had a typo there. Your strongest detox uh, antioxidant, if you will. Um, so there's, I mean, glutathione uh, helps to recharge vitamin E. It helps to recharge uh, vitamin C in your body. So glutathione is kind of the, the, the mother of all antioxidants, if you will. It helps with detoxification, helps with other antioxidants to work to their uh, maximum capacity. So um, if, we, if we know we have a heavy toxic burden in our, in our bodies, um, glutathione might be one of those, those products that can help, you know, Im improve your detox pathways just in general. Uh, phase four, so healing infections. I, I, didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but um, again, if you're struggling, you're, you, you're doing all these um, food uh, changes and, and diet changes and lifestyle changes, um, and you're, again, you're still not getting where you need to be. Sometimes we have to look at um, uh, chronic infections. So there's things like Epstein-Barr, and many other viral infections that are long-term, uh, that are, you know, going on in your system day to day that you really don't notice per se. They're kind of running in the background. You know, and they're, they're they're taking up uh, valuable energy out of your system. They are um, wreaking havoc on your immune system, obviously. So sometimes we don't we think of an infection that we would necessarily feel like a cold or a flu. Like with Epstein-Barr, you might have a uh, a high viral load. 
uh, of this particular virus and not really necessarily feel it per se. So some of these tests um, or some of these autoimmune conditions can be related to um, some of these chronic infections. Um, you can have bacterial infections as well. Um, uh, Lyme disease. We, there's a lot of patients that come here I know through the door that have Lyme disease and that thing morphs into a million different things and there's uh, you know, dozens of different co-infections. I'm not going to get all into Lyme disease. We could spend two hours just talking about that tonight. Um, we do offer Lyme disease testing here as well. Um, that just comes with, um, it's a separate test that, that Cope Labs in Waukesha offers. Um, no, it's, it's, the, it's measuring uh, antibody levels as well. Uh, the Lyme test is 260, I think. No. Is it no, this Lyme. Um, <clears throat> and then phase five is, is reducing stress. Um, again, I'm not going to spend all kinds of time on this, but we, we don't want to skip over it either. Um, we know that increased levels of stress leads to increased risk of infection, uh, leads to uh, more inflammation in the system. Uh, then in turn that inflammation leads to tissue damage and so forth. <clears throat> um, so whatever that is to help your body reduce stress, um, you know, we want to go after that to allow our immune system to work at, at top function. <clears throat> uh, so autoimmune and LDN, I'm kind of talk a little bit about, um, this is a neat product that's been out for, for quite a while actually. It was actually developed by DuPont in the 70s. Uh, for a completely different reason um, <laughs> that I won't get into tonight. But, um, but long story short, um, low-dose naltrexone uh, is something that we compound here. Uh, a lot of doctors in this area and in Wisconsin um, will send patients here to get this product, but it helps to boost the immune system. Um, but it, it, it regulates, um, so what it's doing, the mechanism, uh, to put it very plainly, is to, it upregulates endogenous endorphin production. So Endorphins, there's many different subclasses of these, the, these peptides in our body. Um, but what they're doing is they're improving our immune system and allowing our immune system to distinguish, again, our own cells from pathogens. Um, but at the same time, it, it doesn't lower our ability to fight infection. So there are some products out there um, that, yeah, they can improve your immune system as far as, you know, recognizing, again, foreign matter versus your own tissue but then at the same time, they weaken your natural defenses to fight infections in general. Uh, you, you don't see that with low-dose naltrexone. So it's, it really gives you the best of both worlds. This product isn't for everyone. Um, it does have a long time in some patients to see its benefit, you know, even up to six months to a year. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because we've, we've had, have seen, I personally have seen some miraculous um, uh, success with this product with patients. Um, you know, patients with MS, I've seen a lot of um, profound changes with those patients. Um, and and um, I've seen patients with Crohn's use this that have had a lot of success as well, too. Um, so if you're not from... Yeah. Yep. Now, I know naltrexone is contraindicated with uh, opioids. Opioids. Would the low dose be it, or no? No. no. Yeah. So if you yeah, if you're if you're on basically narcotic pain medication, then you cannot be on this. Yeah. But, your but you can't. Yeah. Care physician have to be involved in or, you know, prescribing. Yes. Well, yeah. It, it, uh, you do need it. It's prescription only. Yeah. Yeah. So then, do you work with docs, or would it be up to the individual patient? Uh, no, I would no. I, uh, I'm advocating for you. So I would if if you're interested in this, definitely come see me. And um, you know, I would need to know more. You know, about you as the individual, and um, you know, petition the doctor on your behalf to to, to you know see if this is a good fit for you. Because yeah, it's not. It certainly isn't for everyone. But I definitely think it's worth worth, worth mentioning. Um, on that. Uh, so what's the first thing you're going to do when you get home tonight? <laughs> after, after that. I have a loaf of bread. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot. I know this answer's not, yeah. A lot of different answers for this. But, but the right answer is this. You're going to get rid of gluten. That's, that's the right answer. 
Um, and then what's the second thing you're going to do when you get home tonight? After you get rid of gluten. Take a probiotic. Take a, well, take a probiotic. Um, you're going to start healing, healing your gut. Yeah, you take a probiotic. Um, really, if you can do those two things, um, you know, again, it's, everyone's going to have a different journey on, on getting off of the autoimmune spectrum. You know, everyone's at a different place right now, but we want to start getting back down to basically ground zero. Um, and if you don't heal your gut, I mean, you could, you know, do all these other things that we talked about tonight. Um, but if you have intestinal permeability, you're going to be getting material through your GI tract that is going to constantly be just bombarding your immune system and, and giving your immune system basically bad information. And you're going to be getting these antibodies that are cross-reacting that shouldn't be. Um, and that's what we really need to, to focus on. <clears throat> I think that's it. All right, so I'm going to try to go through and explain all of this. So this little guy right here that looks like a maggot <laughs> is actually, they were, I don't know why they picked that, but that's what they depicted as gluten. <clears throat> <laughs> um, so what happens with gluten, even though I didn't, like I, in my food allergy test, I didn't have an allergy to gluten. Um,